Amen. Very good. Thank you, Doug. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you here in worship, whether you are in person or if you have joined us online. Today is a very special day in the life of Mount Moriah Church because today is the day that we are expressing our commitments to God in our faithfulness and our resources for this coming year. And this is also Thanksgiving Sunday as we are thankful for all the things that we already have received Now, I've been told that the video that we have of the church bell from the chapel, I really need to shoot a new video because that's showing things too green. But you know, I think I'm going to leave it because I like seeing that green to remind us that even as we're in the midst of winter, we're not stuck here. So even though we are dealing with uh, rising cases of COVID all around us and Thanksgiving week is going to be a very different thing than what most of us really want to have, we know that we are able to look forward to something more. So let's keep the green, even if it's just in a video and in our hearts. And let's thank God for the greens and the reds and the browns and everything else as we worship together. Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious God. On this day, we are so thankful, even in the midst of trying circumstances. God, may you bless this experience of worship together, that we may know and experience the fullness of who you are and who you have created us to be. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able, whether you're at home or in the room, and we're going to sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Good morning. Good morning. So one of the things that I absolutely loved getting in school were these. Stickers, thank you. Okay, they're stickers. Now these were some of my favorite kinds of stickers because these glitter, or sometimes I got my favorite color, which is purple. And sometimes if you scratch them and then you smell them, they would smell like strawberry or grape or even chocolate. Now one of the reasons why I loved getting stickers is because it meant that I did something really good. I either got a really good test score, or I turned my homework in on time several days in a row, or sometimes the teacher would just notice that I had done something kind, and she wanted to give me a reward. Now Jesus also sees us when we do something kind, and he promises us in Matthew 25, that whenever I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. When I was homeless, you gave me a place to stay. When I was sick, you nursed me back to health. And when I was in prison, you visited me. And, and of course, all of us say, well, Jesus, when did we ever do that to you? And he says, whenever you did this to the least of these, you did it to me. Now, unfortunately, Jesus' reward doesn't come quite as quickly as a star sticker on a test. But, oh, the reward is so much greater when we get to heaven and he throws open the gates and says, Welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Would you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God. Dear God, thank you for stickers. Thank you, thank you for stickers. And thank you for the promise of rewards. And thank, and you, thank you, you for the promise, promise of rewards. rewards. Help us know. Help, help us, us know. Those around us. Those around us. Who need our help. Who need, who need our, our help. help. In Jesus' name. In, In Jesus' name. name. Amen. 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 And if you're a kid, you can come on down with me and we'll head on to Sunday school.
Thank you, Deborah and Doug, for that beautiful music. As we move into a time of prayer, we have many that we want to uh, remember in prayer. Uh, we want to uh, pray for the family of Richard Smokey Burgess. Smokey passed away last week, and so uh, we want to uh, pray for his family and, and their mourning. A uh, memorial for him will be held at a later date. Uh, we want to remember a friend of Tina's named Becky. She was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she is in her early 30s and has two young kids at home. So we, we pray for Becky as she begins her, her treatments for that. Sylvia Daniel is home and uh, is continuing to do very well after her uh, liver transplant surgery was successful, and uh, she appreciates all the cards and phone calls. She cannot take any visitors. So if you want to send her a card, that would be the best thing that you could do for Sylvia right now to, to let her know that you're praying for her. And COVID has struck quite close to home in the Mount Moriah Church family in this last week. Um, the, the ark has been closed for this coming week because of a potential uh, COVID situation there in uh, the classrooms. And Mary Ely is at St. Elizabeth's Hospital dealing with COVID. Linda Missman is at home with COVID. And uh, Jim Shriver's brother, Jeff, um, I can't remember if Jim said he definitely had COVID, but he's been very ill this past week as well. And so it's been all around us, and we need to be in prayer for all these people that have been impacted on, by the, the coronavirus and for the higher counts that are happening all over our country and, and indeed right here close to home. Let's take all these things that are on our lips and that which is in our hearts, and let us take a few moments for silent prayer. The Lord, as we come to the end of the month of November, and we enter into the, the week of the Thanksgiving holiday. Sometimes it can feel very difficult to feel thankful this year. And God, we pray for all of these who have been impacted by a disease, by not being able to be with family and friends, but not being able to go and do the things that we all want to do. God, help us to be thankful anyway because we are still here and you are still here and you bring us together. And today we can rest assured in your presence that all things work to the good for those who love the Lord and are called according to your purpose. So we pray, Lord, that you will call us today, equip us today, and enable us to be the kind of neighbor that will make a difference to our neighbors, no matter how near or far they may be. God, we pray that this coming season of Advent and Christmas will be a reminder that Emmanuel is still God with us. 
And may we be with you as we remember the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we are concluding the series called Count Your Blessings. And we're looking at the blessing of rewards. And the scripture comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter, starting at verse 31 and reading through verse 46. Hear now these words. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick. And you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or or needing clothes and clothe you? When, When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal punishment life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? O Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us and help us to understand what rewards are about and how we may receive them. Amen. Now, I'm really thankful that as I was reading that scripture and I looked over here to the right, this is where all of you were, and as I looked over to the left, there was nobody in that section in the sanctuary. Those of you at home, hopefully when you were watching me, you weren't sitting off to my left so you felt like I was directing that text towards you because this is one of those things that it's an uncomfortable text to look at. But as we think about blessings and all that we've done through this series, we we started by talking about home and and the blessing of home being where you can always go and where they will always welcome you in. And God welcomes us into His home. And we talked about health and the spiritual, the physical, and the the mental and emotional healths that, that God wants us to Be blessed in all of these, but what God really pays attention to is our spiritual health. And so we need to be right with God spiritually, even if we aren't able to be as healthy as we want in the other areas. 
We talked a little bit about family and how family is more than just a, a blood relationship, but family is best understood by being gathered together with people who are doing God's will. When we are in God's will together, we become family. And we've experienced that in so many ways as the family of Mount Moriah Church. We talked a little bit about faith and where the head and the heart join together in the hand. And so that the mental process of thinking about your faith and asserting things and the emotions of your faith and feeling things become a way of expressing our loyalty to God so that others can see our faith. And then we also talked about resources last week and how God is able to take our limited resources and do unlimited things if we are willing to let him organize us and break us first. So it leaves us today to finally talk about rewards. And rewards are the fulfillment of all of God's promises when God will bring heaven down to earth. And so that is something that we can be looking forward to and living into even while we wait for it to all finally take place. So why do you do what you do? Why do you behave in, in certain ways? Why do you make decisions in certain aspects? And this is a question that behavioral psychologists have tried to answer. They've tried to come up with, why do we do what we do? And they look at it from a variety of aspects. One way is they, they look at it from a physical standpoint. They will study the brain and how the synapses in your brain will fire. And, and when you think in certain ways or you feel certain things, certain parts of the brain will be active and engaged, and they will do all kinds of measurements to try to figure out what's going on between our ears. Now, it's a challenge because the only way that this part of our body is active is if it is connected and inside they can't, take off the top of your head and watch your brain work. So they have to use all kinds of different tools and, and resources to try to, to figure these things out. It's a mystery for them. They also will look at the emotional aspects. What are our emotions doing and, and how do our moods impact our ability to think and to behave? And, and they'll be looking at the idea of what gives us pleasure or what gives us pain and how does that fit into things. And they'll also deal with the, the cognitive aspects, the, the logic behind why we do things, or sometimes the illogic behind why we do things. And so scientifically, we've only been trying to answer this question really since the mid-20th century. But of course, from the standpoint of the experience, we've been doing this since the beginning of the human race, trying to figure out why do people behave the way they behave and how can we get people to behave in certain ways or not behave in certain ways. And it basically boils down to this. If it feels good, we will do it. If it feels bad, we won't. And that has led to two types of motivation. One is to behave in ways to get rewarded, which will give you pleasure, or avoid the ways that will give you pain, which means punishment. Rewards and punishment are the two basic components of everything that we have. And, and for much of human history, the idea was that you could control behaviors best through the threat of pain. You go look back in history and it's full of people causing pain. Empires were built on the idea of conquer. 
rule by the sword, and if might makes right, then I've got to be the mightiest so that I can be right and be over everybody else. And even if you go and look at the, the myths and the legends of the ancient civilizations, whether it's the Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Greek, Chinese, they're full of stories of the, of the gods punishing each other or the gods punishing humans because we stood in the way of what the gods wanted to do. So a whole bunch of the idea of pain or avoiding pain is how you get people to behave. And, and it's, it's true. I mean, how many times do you have to touch something hot before you know not to touch it anymore? I can remember when I was in the second grade and I went down the street to, to visit a friend of mine and I got to his house and in his driveway was one of those really, really fancy souped up type race cars. And it was one of these cars that was built out of, of an old car, probably a, a 1930s something, and it had the exhaust coming out across the side and then the pipes coming down on either side of the car. And it was this gleaming, beautiful red car and then the most brilliant silver on the manifold. And I just had to admire that car. And I reached out with my hand to touch that chrome. I didn't know the car had just been driven. Do you know what happens to exhaust pipes when the car is on? They get hot. And my hand just barely touched it before I pulled it away. But already I had first and second degree burns all across my hand. You know, I have never touched a car's exhaust again. <laughs> it only took once because I did not want that pain happening to me. And so pain is one of these things that it really does do something to cause us to behave in certain ways. But the funny thing is, is that pain really isn't the best motivator. People who've engaged in tortures have come to realize that just because you torture somebody doesn't mean you're always going to get the truth out of them. And so what we have begun to understand is that fear isn't enough to really understand behaviors and motivations. There's also the reward side of things, and rewards are actually superior motivators than punishment is. Think about Infants, why do babies smile? They smile because they see the adults smiling. When, when mom or dad is holding that baby and they're cooing at them, Ooh, hee, 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 and the baby does the hee, 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 back, what does the parent do? They get even more excited because they've been rewarded and that creates this feedback loop with the baby. Even before the baby really understands what it's doing, it knows that it just did something that made another person respond and that reinforces the idea of smile. Now for us right now, wearing our masks, we think, oh, it doesn't matter whether I'm smiling or not, but it does. Because even when you put the mask on, If I'm like this and feeling a little bit dour, you can see it not only the lower half of the face is covered, but you can see it in the eyes. And when I'm smiling, you can see it in the eyes too. And so smiles matter. And in fact, you could say that a reward is anything that makes us smile. And so that can come in all kinds of, of shapes and sizes and, and forms, but they are a, a recognition. And that's what rewards are all about. Now, rewards can be extrinsic, being outside of ourselves, or they can be intrinsic, being within ourselves. But, but here's the really interesting thing. Extrinsic rewards only matter if we give them an intrinsic value. Facebook learned this back in 2009 when they introduced the like button. 
Do you remember a time before likes existed on Facebook? It revolutionized the way people engaged with that social media. All of a sudden, it was all about collecting likes. Why? Because we made them valuable. A like is nothing other than just a little image on a screen, but we put this intrinsic pleasure into how many likes did that post get? How many shares and likes of those shares did you get? And social media is all about this extrinsic thing creating an intrinsic aspect within us. That's why people who are on Twitter want to get a whole bunch of retweets. That's why people that are on TikTok want to have a whole bunch of of shares and YouTubers want to have subscribers to their channels and if you aren't on any of those things that in and of itself can be a type of reward. I don't have to mess with it. But human history and experience notwithstanding the idea of rewards actually goes back to God. God is the one who created the concept of reward. And the very first reward is creation itself. You and I, the fact that we exist, this is a type of reward that we are able to experience this life that God has given us. You might might describe this as being your participation award. We all get to participate. But the final rewards ceremony is described in Matthew 25 when Jesus is talking about when the Son of Man will come in His glory and He will sit on His throne and He will gather all the nations. And then He will separate them based on a particular set of criteria. Those who did and those who did not. And what is it that they did or didn't do? It was engage in helping others, particularly the most vulnerable. I don't know what it is about human society, but we tend to want to take care of ourselves or take care of our own before we ever want to take care of others. But when Jesus is talking about what he is going to reward, he is going to reward those who choose to take care of others, maybe even more than they choose to take care of themselves. And so it's an interesting dynamic going on here, but there's some things that this reward ceremony is not. And what it is not, number one, is it is not a competition between sheep and goats. One of the things that we as human beings tend to do is we create an us versus them in anything and want to claim we are the us and they are the them. But that's not what Jesus is doing here. Jesus isn't putting the sheep and the goats in competition with each other. He's simply sorting them based on what they've already been doing. It's sheep and goats. And none of us needs be a goat. Nor do we need to accuse others of being goats. We don't have to go into that kind of a thinking process. There's no competition here. Another thing that this is not is this is not an example of premeditation or predetermination on God's part in who is going to be where as a sheep or as a goat. God is not predetermined to say, all right, Sheep, sheep, goat, sheep, goat, sheep, sheep, goat. That's not what he's doing. He is looking at who we are and what we have been. It's not arbitrary. It's truly just. And the third thing that this is not is this is not a works-based righteousness. There are some people that will look at this and say, oh, well, if all I do is go visit people in prison, and if I will go and check on sick people in the hospital, if I will give clothes to the goodwill, and I will give food to the pantry, then, hey, I'm covered. No. All those things that you would be doing, what is the motivation behind them? Why are you doing them? Or not? doing them. See, the reward ceremony is an examination of the choices that we all make. 
And what Jesus is saying is that the behaviors that are seen as good are behaviors that are other-oriented. Do you live your life oriented towards others, or do you live your life in selfish ignorance? If so, selfish ignorance is not bliss. And so this is what we have to understand is that our ultimate reward is eternal life based on how we deal with the life we're given in the first place. Our ultimate punishment is nothingness and bitterness and a hatred of all things, including ourselves. And ultimately, this is what it all will boil down to. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. He lived in the 20th century. He died even before I was born, but his books have had incredible influence on me and my life, and most people know him best for the Narnia books. But he also wrote some others, and and in a book that he wrote called The Great Divorce, has anybody ever read that? It's not a very long book, but it's, it's, it's fascinating in its concept because what Lewis writes in The Great Divorce is about heaven and hell. And he writes it in the first person as he sees himself in this place where he gets to go on a bus and the bus goes to heaven. And everybody who rode the bus up to heaven, they look like ghosts. In the story, because there's there's a transparency about them. They they aren't solid, but the residents of heaven are truly solid. They have a substance to them that the the ghosts simply don't have. And so the the story unfolds by Lewis witnessing different encounters between ghosts and solids. And as he's puzzling about all of this, suddenly a guy comes up to him, and the guy who came up to him is George MacDonald. Anybody ever heard of him? George MacDonald was an early fantasy writer. He was a peer of Lewis Carroll. And he wrote fantasy with Christian themes. And he was influential on Lewis and Lewis's writing. And so MacDonald died in real life in 1905. And so here's Lewis and MacDonald having a conversation. And MacDonald is trying to explain to Lewis what it is that Lewis is seeing and how important it is for Lewis to understand what he's seeing. And so here is something that MacDonald explains about the ideas of heaven and hell and good and evil. He says, both good and evil, when they are full grown, become retrospective. This is what mortals misunderstand. They say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for it. Not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backward and turn even that agony into glory. And of some sinful pleasure, they say, let me have this and I'll take the consequences little dreaming how damnation will spread back and back into their past and contaminate the pleasure of sin. Both processes begin even before death. The good man's past begins to change so that his forgiven sins and remembered sorrows take on the quality of heaven. The bad man's past already conforms to his badness and is filled only with dreariness. And that is why at the end of all things, when the sun rises here and the twilight turns to blackness down there, the blessed will say, we have never lived anywhere except in heaven. And the lost, we were always in hell. And both will speak truly. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. Those who knock, it is opened. And the first time that I read that, it was just like mind-blown. 
I'm already in heaven, even though I don't know it yet, because God's working his bliss into me. And even the struggles, even the pain, even the hurts, they become part of my ultimate reward. Conversely, if I'm choosing to ignore the joy that's offered to me from Christ, then hell is already working its way into my soul. And it doesn't matter how much I think I enjoy what I'm doing right in this moment. In the end, it comes out as meaningless and without purpose. And as I look at our world today, I see a world full of people going to hell who don't even know it. My friends, we are surrounded by goats, but they don't have to be goats. We don't have to be goats. If we will seek, we will find. If we will knock, the door will be opened. My friends, if if you're already doing the things in Matthew 25, you're already experiencing heaven. If you're not doing the things in Matthew 25, we're already experiencing pieces of hell. And if you feel like maybe hell is hitting you, today is the day to push back, to seek something better, to switch from being a self-centered individual to being other-oriented, to switch from being focused on pain to be a road to ruin and seeing it as putting you on the path towards redemption and to commit yourself and everything about you to pursuing Jesus. The rewards are there. God has already said, this is yours. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the churches, he would always say, I pray that you will know the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God. Because it's already here. That reward is among us. If only we will receive it and reflect it back to God. (laughs) You'll get your stickers. Amen. This morning we are offering our thanksgiving for the gifts that we are receiving and we are also collecting our commitment cards for the coming year. I thank all of you who have already submitted your your cards, your commitments and pledges for this coming year. And those that are bringing them today, if you still haven't done that yet, please do so in this next week so that we will be able to plan our budgets for the coming year and be able to know how we will be able to do the good works that Matthew 25 describes. Let us pray. God, we thank you for rewards the ones that we know about and the ones that are still to come. God, may you help us to understand that heaven is already working in us if only we will allow it to do so. God, may the gifts that we present today and the pledges for the gifts of tomorrow all be driven out of this heavenly motivation to do for others and to do it to the least of these in your name. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our doxology. join me in the prayer of dedication for these commitment cards. We give to you, dear Lord, not because we can, but because we should. We have learned that we find joy in giving 
and we, and we discover, discover the blessing and reward of making a positive difference in the lives of others. And we receive assurance that our own lives are blessed and rewarded both now and in heaven. We, we have, have counted, counted our blessings and, and now know that despite the challenges of this year, we may trust and serve you. you. Accept these commitments, give us grace to live into these commitments, and bless our stewardship according to your will. In Christ's, In Christ's name, name we, we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. Would you remain seated as we prepare to sing our closing song? for a moment as I tell you some ways that you can engage in reward opportunities. First of all, this afternoon at 4 p.m. is our online Thanksgiving service. Go to the, the church website and you will find the link right there that will give you access to this. Doug has written some really incredible music and you have contributed all of your thankful statements, and we've pulled those together, and it's going to be a very special time of engagement and reflection. That'll be at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Next week, next Sunday, begins the season of Advent, and going out into the mail, we were supposed to go on Friday, but the post office didn't cooperate with us, so it's going out on Monday, is an Advent Devotions and Activities book. Um, one of these has been mailed to each of our families, both of the church and of the Ark of Learning. And inside this, there are activities and poems and things to talk about, some prayer prompts. And each week, it will have a devotion for you and your family to do together, where you will light an Advent wreath share together some of the, the readings and conversations to do a song, and this is a way for you to experience Advent even if you aren't able to be in church together. This will let your family experience it at home. And so this is going out to all families, and if you don't have kids at home, you can still do the devotions, or you can pass it on to the family members that do have children, and that will be a great way for you to engage with folks. 
December the 7th at 7 p.m. We're going to be celebrating the season with a night of music. Doug is going to be playing multiple holiday-type pieces, maybe a few other things mixed in there. Do you know well, what you're doing yet? there definitely be some other things mixed in there. There's going to be other things mixed in Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Are we going to get a, a Texas hoedown? We'll see. Ah. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe, maybe doing that in the, uh, with the song Silent Night. Silent, Silent Night, Night hoedown, hoedown style. That will be interesting. We'll if you would like to see that, <laughs> you need to make a reservation to come and be a part of this. Mary Suttles or Kay Ilg are the people to contact to make your reservation. We are limiting the capacity to what we can do in the room with COVID. But that's coming up on Monday, December the 7th. We're also bringing acolytes back starting next week. And if you have anyone in your family that is at least second grade and is interested in being an acolyte, contact Diane Bailey, and she will add you into the list of being an acolyte and schedule you in. And on sun, uh, December the 5th, whatever day of the week that is, is a scavenger hunt with Santa. And there's information about that in your worship guide, and there will be information in email and on our website. But it's going to be a way for us to go around and capture things about the holiday with our children and then come back and have a goodie bag and the potential to win the grand prize. This is a safe, socially distant scavenger hunt to kick off the holiday season. And if you are interested in knowing more, you can contact Natalie Clater, and she will be able to fill you in on how to have fun with all of that. My friends, this is a season of rewards, even if we don't feel them instantly. God is at work in us and around us and through us. So go and behave as one who is rewarded. Amen. Oh,